Hi, everybody. Welcome to uh, a special edition of the Beth Lita Parsha Chat. In this session, we're going to look not just at Parshas Vayeshev, which is this week's Torah portion, but also the way in which it intersects with themes around Hanukkah. Hanukkah, the winter festival of lights, always, never, not once does it not, intersect with, uh, coincide with, rather, the um, story of Joseph. Almost always, I think maybe even, almost always, Shabbos Hanukkah is Parshas Miketz, and which means that the Shabbos before Hanukkah often is Vayeshev, which is this coming, uh, this coming Shabbos. And Hanukkah starts Sunday night, so Hanukkah is on everyone's mind. So I want to look at the way in which the Torah portion is getting us ready to think about, and I think in, in a way, like, this is the way the holiday works. It's always coming around when with the Joseph story. So what do the Joseph story and the Hanukkah, not the story per se, but the Hanukkah themes have to say to each other? So before we get into the texts, and you know me, there are texts, um, what, just like from your, uh, picking from the text of your heart, what would you say, um, where are, is there interesting, fruitful room for dialogue between Joseph and Hanukkah? Does anything immediately come to mind? It's a bit abstract, and it's definitely a bit out there. I'm just wondering if, if anyone else has had that kind of this has uh, raised this question before as well. Okay, I'm going to take the deafening silence as uh, evidence of my original, uh, the original idea I have for this class. Wow, what a great new idea this class is. Um, so let's go right into the texts. Um, no one's allowed to make fun of me. Okay, okay. So everyone see that okay? Okay. Yes. So, Yosela uh, We're going to look at the way in which there is, and this is actually this this class is actually going to lead us into our pre Hanukkah, um, our mid Hanukkah class on Tuesday evening, in which we will look about the law of where you place the Hanuk the Hanukkiah, and we're going to see how actually that question ends up getting raised in these texts as well. But the the subtitle here is looking into the darkness, because we're going to look at the seed text of Joseph being cast into a pit. For whatever reason, Joseph loves being thrown into a hole. He just It just keeps on happening to him. It happens to him with his brothers, and that's the one we're going to focus on. And then at the end of this week's Parsha, it's going to happen again when he's, thrown, when he's framed and thrown in jail in the dungeon by uh, Potiphar. So, um, just a quick stage setting. Joseph is problematically his father Jacob's favorite son. The other 11 kids don't take kindly to that. Joseph does not know how to read the room and is constantly showing his brothers how cool he is. His brothers take umbrage to that effect and uh, throw him in a pit again. The question that's raised from this is, um, you know, Joseph is, while Joseph is the protagonist in this novella of sorts, near the end of Sefer Bracius, um, the other brothers are still also uh, lead characters too. They're also, you know, we are also see ourselves in light of them, right? Not everybody is descendant of Joseph. In fact, nobody's descendant of Joseph anymore. So, um, the before Shem, the commentators are troubled by the fact that this really seems to cast the brothers in not just a bad light, but like a really bad light. Because what's like the dividing line? This dividing line is often used by superheroes as well. Like, what's the dividing line here? They throw him into a pit. What's like, what, what's the, what's the, what, what really is like the rub? Just think, just think about it for a second. Like, what are they about to do, it seems? They're going to let him die in there. Yeah, they're going to, I mean, not just let him die, but like, I mean, and here's really actually where we're going to, we're going to talk a lot about vision and sight and like lines of sight. If you throw someone into a pit, right, best case scenario, they're going to die of like exposure or starvation. Worst case scenario, what? They could be bitten by a snake, by a... Uh, Scorpion, this is this is Israel, and I know that the the midrashim say it was filled with skates. Oh, okay, yes, Scorpions well, snakes, get ready, but... get ready for that. But also, right? I mean, you know, it's that. But I mean, and, and not even to get quite that um, 
specific, but just think about like what pits are. <laughs> What's another risk when you throw someone into a large hole in the earth? It could fill with water. You could drown. Well, ah, okay, good. So the question <laughs> well, is, water could elevate you so that you float and you get back down. <laughs> also a good question, right? The question is whether actually there's water in there such that you're going to be drowning somebody. So that's a very relevant question as we'll see. And also, and this is maybe just like a little bit, maybe too obvious in a way, but what if, you know, he dies, right? Like what if he gets like, he breaks his neck? It's a oh, hole. Like from being thrown in. Yeah, you're just getting thrown into a hole, right? What if it's like full of jagged rocks and stuff, right? So the question is like, okay, so there's a certain level to which, of, of tolerance we have for the brothers' misbehavior, right? Of them, maybe like in a way we're sympathizing, empathizing with them, like getting fed up with Joseph. Okay, they throw him into a pit, right? And it seems so like... The throwing into the pit was a, almost like a compromise their mercy like they originally were gonna just kill him outright and mm. right so it seems like exactly so it seems like them throwing him into the pit is not a means to kill him but rather to like put it on ice in a way to see what they're gonna do get him they're removing him from the board but they don't want to cross that you know the rubicon were, they, uh, so, were mm. they so mad at their father for favoring joseph that it didn't matter that they were going to break his heart or worse from just that's a, returning. That's a great question because we're not going to look at that, but you know, what they do is they kill a, they kill um, a sheep and they dip, you know, they rip off, we're going to look at that, you know, they, they rip off his uh, coat of many colors, right? And they like, and they squeegee it with a bunch of blood. And then they bring that to show their father to say like, look, a wild animal killed him. And his father's very aggrieved by that. And it seems like, it seems like they're kind of caught in this kind of like classic filial tension, right? Between on one hand being envious, right? Of Joseph and like desirous of their father, of the love that the father was showing. On the other hand, angry and, you know, like it's very edible, right? It's like they want to like on one hand get the love from their father, but on the other hand, like avenge, you know, like get some kind of revenge. It's, it's very, you know, it's very human. <laughs> Okay, so let's look at the text, and then we can uh, we can keep on talking about this element. But um, but oh, it, oh yeah, but also after languishing in the pit, right? Then they end up selling him into slavery with a bunch of Midianites, and the Midianites then sell him to a guy named Potiphar, who then um, he then like works his way up the ranks, becomes the Potiphar's major domo, is, and then uh, Potiphar's wife um, basically framed, you know, tr uh, is sexually aggressive and joseph fends her off and then she frames him and then he gets thrown in jail so that's a you know quick quick recap story so um it says right they saw joseph from afar and before he was close to them they quickly kind of seems like they confabbed and they made a plan to kill him right says oh look the master of dreams is coming right so here what we have is this tension between joseph's gift and he does have a gift right he has a gift of um what's called onero po po poetry he is able to um uh interpret dreams all right he is a seer of some kind he's a visionary and his brothers you know and but his dreams you know uh, which he used to show off uh, his dreams of the, the the stars and the moon and the sun bowing to him, and the dreams of the of the sheaves of wheat bowing to him, right? Coincidentally, being the exact number of his family members. Um, so, like the dream, i.e., Joseph's connection to something more, is really like what is catalyzing this envy and this vitriol from his brothers. <laughs> um, it says. <laughs> We're going to grab him, and we're going to kill him, and we're going to throw him in the pit. So it seems like originally, what was the pit? It seems like it's like in, um, it's like in a god, it's like in a mafia movie. All right, they killed him already, they had, and then they have to go take care of the body. Right? It's like the hole that they dig, you know, in the middle, you know, like you, you kill somebody in a movie and then you go, you bury them in the middle of the night with the car running. So you use the headlamps as, uh, as you can see in the in the forest or whatever. 
right? Or you know, or like in Goodfellas, you take him out to the to the to the field. Um, so here it seems like the the pit is a way to finalize the murder. It says, oh, and then we're going to say to our father, right, that some wild animal killed him. Um, and then like, oh, look where his look where his dreams got him now. <laughs> it's, a, it's a real line. Um, Ruven, and here comes Reuben, right? And Reuben is a very interesting kind of tragic figure because Reuben is is what um, order of the of the children of the of the sons? He's the oldest. Right, he's the firstborn. So you'd think that he would be the one to exercise leadership, and in a way, this is this kind of like kind of half tushed attempt to do that. Right? It says, "Oh, let's." Let's, uh, Ruvain heard the plan. Was he part of the plan? Unclear. And he said, okay, so let's, let's make sure to save his life. Vayomer lo not keno nafesh. Let's not kill him. Vayomer aleim Ruvain. So Ruvain said to them, al tishpechu dam ashli chuoso la bor hazeh. So no, 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 don't kill him. But yes, let's still throw him in the pit. Okay. So the pit is a constant. Right? Fascinatingly, the pit is a constant, both between the original design to potentially murder Joseph, and then in this kind of, let's put him on ice kind of thing, a pit as a stasis chamber. Um, so, I, you know, the, the, the text is wanting us to pay attention to the pit. The pit never goes away. So the pit is what's going to draw our attention in thinking about, in thinking about um, the story of Hanukkah and the story of Joseph. Specifically, I think the notion of heights and depths the notion of um, what our relationship is with things that are hidden, right? Joseph's um, ability to uncover secrets, right? To interpret a dream which is opaque to the par to the person who has it, right? Ends up both being his gift, but also being something that gets him in trouble. And those two things co go together, right? To be able to reveal a secret requires there to be darkness. Of some kind. Right? Hanukkah's emplacement in the darkest time of the year has never seemed like an accident to me. You know, I know lots of cultures have festivals of light, or you know, kal kalenda, as we talked about last year, Christmas, Lahavdil Elif Havdalas, Diwali, right? All of these holidays are, are light based holidays in the winter. But there's something specific and there's something unique about Hanukkah. And we talked about the universal element last year, about the winter solstice and things like that. But there's something specific and unique about Hanukkah. And it has to do with the not just the bringing in of light as a counterpoint to darkness, but Hanukkah's, in a way, embrace of the darkness. Hanukkah is not a holiday of light defeating darkness. It's a holiday of light's existence within darkness. And that's what we're going to look at. Joseph, the uncoverer of secrets, is put into the deepest hole. That's where he lives. Hanukkah needs the darkness for the light. And that's where we're going to explore with, with Joseph. So, um, da 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 da. Ba yikachir ba Yosef alachave shi tu as Yosef as kutnos kutonto as kutainas apasi masher alav. Right? They they grab Joseph, they strip his coat of many colors from him, and they throw him in the pit. They grab him and they throw him in the pit. Right, so per Susie's point from before, does the pit have water? Very important point. And the Pusuk says the pit was empty, there was no water. And the rabbinic mind immediately says, okay, what? What does the rabbinic mind say? Imagine minds can talk. Father pointing that out, so it's an important fact. Good. So the Torah never does anything uh, unnecessarily. Kashbar, who wants us to have these words? But what else? It's Take it even further. Well, mm -hmm. I mean, with no water, you're gonna die more quickly. Yeah, on one hand, right? No water is, on one hand, good because he's not gonna drown. On the other hand, bad because he's gonna die of thirst. Um, I'll, I'll put it this way. My pockets were empty. There was no money. By saying my pockets were empty, it's, uh, do I need to say there's no money? No. Empty means devoid of things. 
So if there's if the pit was empty, why does it have to say there was no water? So this is what this is what's called a kfilus milim, kfilus loshon, right? A doubling of language, i.e., potentially extraneous words. And whenever the rabbis happen upon, or we happen upon, unnecessary words in the Torah, per Susie's point just before, there's never anything unnecessary in Torah. So it must be telling us something. So here we go. All right. So as Lauren cited earlier, vabore ve'ain rak reik in bomayim, the pit was empty with no water in it. Mimash mashnemar vabor reik. It's already implied when it says the pit was empty. No? Aini yodea she'ain bomayim, wouldn't I already know that there's no water? Maltum and lamar, ain bomayim. So why is the Torah saying there's no water? Okay. Mayim ain bo, there's no water, fine. Aval nechashim v'akrabim yesh there's no water, fine. But there is, are, serpents and scorpions. Oh no! Very bad. Yes, Susie? But then it's not empty. Aha! Great point. Put a pin in it that we'll get back to it. But I want you to think about what you just said. Because what you're saying is it's making us ask the question of spatiality, right? What's the space of the pit? When I say the pit is empty, what part of the pit am I talking about? And are there other ways of thinking about the space and the way that we relate to it via sight that might change the way we'd relate to that claim? Okay, so really put a pin in it, but very insightful point, right? So no water, fine, but yes, serpents and scorpions. Oh no, okay. So now we're going to get launched into a gemurah. And the gemurah is part of Perak uh, Bamemadlikin, which is the chapter in the Talmud all about the halachas around lighting Shabbos candles. And uh, there is no special tractate for Hanukkah, but quite beautifully and thematically, the rabbis decide to put a discussion of Hanukkah in this Talmudic tractate about lighting candles, because that's the central act we do on Hanukkah, of course. So it, it starts with a halachic point, but first I want you to want to start with the end, because the end ends up relating to this exact pasuk. It's amazing. It's amazing. So the Amar Rav Kahana, Rav Kahana says, Darish Rav Nasan Bar Minyame. Rav Nasan Bar Minyame makes a uh, he makes a midrash. He makes he exegetes from the text. Mishmed Rav Nachum, quoting Rav Nach Tanhu. What does it say? Ma'idichti va'bor reikin bo'mayim. Why does the Torah say the pit was empty? There was no water. Mimash v'shenemar va'bor reik. Any other shein bo'mayim? This should sound pretty familiar, right? When it says it's empty, wouldn't I already know there's no water? Ela matzum lomar ein bo'mayim. Mayim ein bo'av on the chashim ba'karabim yeshbo. There's no water. Fine, but there is serpents and scorpions. Why is that being brought in as the tail end of this discussion of Hanukkah candles. So I want to give us a little teaser. So let's go back to the discussion. Okay, the discussion goes like this. Um, and this is actually a very important halacha for all of those who live in apartment buildings, like myself. Uh, Rabbi Yehuda Oimer, Rabbi Judah says, B'ner Hanukkah, oh no, actually that's not where I want to start. Apologies, apologies. Da-da-da-da-da. Da-da-da-da-da. -da -da -da. da -da 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 -da. Ah, here it is. Amar Ravina Mishum the Rabbah. Ravina says in the name of Rabbah. Zos Amaris. Ner Chanaka mitzvah lahanicha besochasara. He says it is a mitzvah to put the Chanaka lamp within ten, ten hands breaths. What's called tfachim. Tefach, yes, exactly. So a tefach, there are two basic uh, biblical measurements. There's a tefach and there's a cubit, uh, an ama. Okay? So, Ravina quite interestingly says, it is a mitzvah, you're commanded to put the Hanukkah lamp no more than 10 hands breaths from the ground. Where do you put your Hanukkah lamp? I live on the 11th floor. Okay, but relative to the, to the floor of your apartment. Oh, I put it on the windowsill. Right, so, is that ten hands breaths lower, uh, lower to the ground. Depends how big your hands are. That's, uh, that's true, it's but it's probably more. I would it, think it, it's definitely more. It's definitely more. Um, 
and so Ravina seems to not be, I mean, that's, and that's standard, right? We all do that. That's what all of us do, but it's worth remembering. And actually this is the sugya that I didn't include. Uh, traditionally speaking, where is the Hanukkah put? And think, you know, Lauren, uh, think back to Yerushalayim, Merkadesh, right? Where's the Hanukkah put? Oh, it's where people can see it. And some people have those beautiful Good. boxes outside Good. of the apartment. Good. So where people can see it is exactly right. So put, so let's not let, you know, let's keep that bubbling on the stove. But yes, so traditionally speaking, in Eretz Yisrael, the Chanukiah is put at the left doorpost of your courtyard gate. And in your right doorpost, there's a mezuzah. So you're surrounded by blessings. It's quite beautiful. So as you walk in, you have a mezuzah to your right, and you have a Chanukiah to your left. But it's not on the windowsill. It is seems to it's like on a stand close ish to the ground very interesting right so now let's go back also so this is you know not quite in the text but it's an important point right the purpose of the chanukiah is what's called pirsume nisa to publicize the miracle of hanukkah so as lauren just said it needs to be somewhere noticeable because, you, you know, if a tree falls in the forest and no one hears it, the miracle is not publicized, right? People need to be able to notice it for you to be able to do a good PR job for God, right? So this is like, a, this is like the first, like, um, social media manager. It's like, all right, you got to make something go viral. It's like, what if people light lamps in front of their, in front of their houses all, every winter? Whoa, that would be crazy. Everyone's going to start putting that on Instagram, right? Miracle is promulgated. Okay, so Ravina says it actually, it, it needs to be within 10 hands breadth. So he seems to think that putting it low-ish to the ground is the ideal placement in order for people to pay attention to it. Okay? Because maybe if you're, you know, if you're like, because, I mean, here's the thing. If you're just like looking at your eye's breadth, you're just going to look like, you're gonna just going to walk right by it. Um... So if you're saying, okay, so it should be at eye level, but then fine, actually, maybe you should say it should be at car level, right? At like, you know, if you're riding on a donkey, riding on a camel, that's the level it should be at. So, um, Right? Because if you're saying it should be at that level, then if you're on a camel or a donkey, you're going to like bonk your head on it effectively. And that's not good, which means you actually have to put it on top of that. So, I mean, the point is saying, right, is that there's actually like a middle ground of sight, a middle like stage of sight. It's basically like around where you generally tend to look from when you're walking around versus when you're riding on something. But the problem is if it's going to be at that level, then actually you need to put it above it because then you're going to come into contact with it in some way or another. So like, you know, like where, where, are, um, where are traffic lights? Right, they're very tall, right? Because if they weren't very tall, they would get hit by a truck, right? So like, it's clear that what you need to do is you need to have lights of some kind be up above. But the problem is that there is a top limit because if they're too high up, then nobody notices them, right? And that's the limit of 20 cubits. So we're going to see that right now. So if you put the Hanukkah taller, you know, if you situate it taller than 20 cubits, which is about like 50 feet. No, is that right? This is a cubit. That's like a foot and a half-ish. So it's more like 30-ish, 30, 30, 35 feet. Um, psula, then that actually, that's invalid. Because sukkah chmavoi, because it's the same rule for a sukkah and an Eruv. A sukkah cannot be taller than 20 cubits. It's schach, cannot be taller than 20 cubits from the ground. And if you make an Eruv, you also can't have it taller than 20 cubits from the ground, like the, the, the wire that you use to make a carry thing for Shabbos. Why? Because you need to be able to notice it. If you're in a sukkah and you can't even see the schach, what's, it's, then you're not really in a sukkah. Right? You have to be able to have the thing that is relevant, right? The thing that is meaningful in your line of sight. Okay, so we have these two boundaries here. There's too tall and potentially too low. When it comes to a sukkah and when it comes to an eruv, they can't be taller than 20 cubits and they cannot be lower than 10 tfachim. But with a chanukiah, there is one opinion that says not only can it be lower than 10 tfachim, 
it needs to be lower than 10 Tfachim. So, even though Ravina does not end up winning the day, Ravina's perspective is fascinating because he and he's right, and he does win in the sense that nobody says it's not allowed to put a Chanukiah that low. Okay? It is the only mitzvah, and this is actually what we're going to talk about next week. It's the only mitzvah in which you're allowed to put a holy object that low. And we'll talk about what the, the boundary of ten tefachim means later. But here we're just talking about the technicalities of the Hanukkiah. And this is exactly where then we bring in the, the serpents and the scorpions. Why? Why in the world are we bringing in the serpents and the scorpions? The Hanukkah, the light or fire would scare them off. Hmm, that's interesting. Okay, so maybe but, like Joseph could like take a piece of it doesn't quite take a piece sense. of flint maybe and like ward them off. It's possible. Okay, I'll give you the cheat answer. The cheat answer is who's the one who says that the um, that the Hanukkah can't be higher than twenty cubits. Rav Kahana slash Rav Nassan Bar Minyome slash Rabbi Tanchum. And who's the one who says this Midrash about the serpents and the scorpions? The same exact people. So this is what in the Talmud is called a kovetz. It's, it means that sometimes they'll just include another teaching by the same people so that you remember them. Oh, they taught something that Rabbi X said. Great, I'll tell you something else that Rabbi X said. Oh, you know what that reminds me of? Because this is Talmud was originally an oral text. An oral text is a mnemonic text. It's a text that you have to memorize. So one of the mnemonic tricks is to include a bunch of teachings by the same people in a bundle, which is called a kovetz. Now, I think that is not sufficiently meaningful enough because it seems like, for whatever reason, the Talmud is juxtaposing these things to, say, to mean that they're speaking to each other. Hanukkah and Joseph are always bumping up against each other. Why? So why is it? that when the Talmud is teaching about how low or how high the Hanukkiah needs to be, it then talks about the most famous hole in the Torah. Right? Size of the hole. I'm sorry? It's the size of the hole. What's the size of the hole? Like how high or how low. Exactly. And not just that. But as we're going to see, actually, in a bunch of really interesting texts that are going to bring these things together, what we're really talking about is what it means to notice something. Right? Something being high up and something being deep within is the same. Because they are both the extremuses of our ability to, to, to pay attention. Right? To bring something into our field of vision. And that's really what we're talking about. Okay? So, onward. Perhaps even upward. Or downward, depending on the whole. All right, so the Meiri was a Rishon from Spain um, who was very understudied because his texts never, like, got uh, sent around that much. They didn't, like, kind of get printed a lot. But then in the modern period, he was, like, rediscovered. And he's a really, really, really great, literarily, like, sensitive um, interpreter of the Talmud. So this is what he writes. He says, Ner Hanukkah. If you put a Hanukkah lamp above 10, 20 cubits, right, and that is allowed or not allowed? Not, not, not allowed. Good. All right, you win the quiz. Psula, that's not valid. Why? Like a sukkah and like an Eruv. She'en kan heker. Why? Because that high up would mean that you're not going to notice it, and that's the determining factor. Mikolmakom, but still, lamata me asara mutter, but you are allowed to put it within, you know, lower than a, the boundary of ten hands breaths, ten tefachim. Lo hushios lesuka umavui, el lamayla miyasrim, but a sukkah and an eruv can only be um, installed higher than those, you know, the, the schach and the eruv wire need to be taller than ten hands breaths. 
Mikomakom. Okay, so just to kind of summarize here, the Meiri is pointing out that there is a unique feature of the Chanukiah, that it is the only mitzvah material that is allowed to be within 10 hands breaths of the ground. It is like a sukkah and an eruv in that they're both not, they're all three of them are not allowed to be higher than 20 cubits, but it is unique that it's the only one of those three that's allowed to be within 10 hands breaths of the ground. Okay, so then the question we're left with, should it be or should it not be? So he says, Mikomakom, Hidr mitzvah lagbia asara laharbos pisuma. He says, still, in order to heighten or to um, to enhance the aesthetic quality of the mitzvah, it's better to to uh, put the chanukiah more than ten hands breaths from the ground. Okay, so that seems to be against this depth point that Ravina. But then he still says, except that there are other post game, there are other rabbis who rule like Ravina who says that it's a mitzvah to put it within 10 hands breaths from the ground. Okay, so there's a few takeaways from this. One takeaway is that nobody was says it's not allowed. It is clearly allowed. The question is a qualitative one, not a quantitative one. It's not whether you're allowed or not. The issue more is like what's best or what's worse. Some people say it's better to put it above because it's basically it's able better to broadcast to people. <laughs> But some rabbis say, no, it's best, and not just best, but necessary to put it within 10 hands breaths. So there's something special about Hanukkah that either it's able to be that close to the depths or not, or it has to be close to the depths. Okay. And remember, I mean, here's something very interesting, right? Is that if it is above 10 hands breaths, it's easier to see. I think everyone would agree with that because it's at all, it's more like, like eye level. You don't look down all the way to the ground when you're walking unless you're a, a real from Jew and you're always looking at your shoes so that you're very humble. Um, so some think it should be where it is most facilely viewable, right? In which seeing it is easiest. That's how to like basically you catch the wave. You make it, you publicize the mitzvah by putting it in the most accessible place. But another perspective says, no, the miracle needs to be in the darkness. It needs to be where it's harder to see. That's where we need to put the light. Okay, it's a dialectical principle. So one says, no, you should put it where it's easiest to see, because then it will be able to broadcast better. But Ravina and the Ravina perspective says, no, you need to bring the light down there because that's the only way people will notice it. By bringing your attention there, where your vision dims, that's where we need the light. Okay. So the Pesach Enayim is a commentary on the Gemara by the Chida, an 18th century uh, mystic, uh, Chaim Yosef David Azulai, uh, descendant of Avram Azulai, another mystic from the 16th century. Um, very important, not just mystic, but also like literary scholar, published a lot of texts. Really interesting, really interesting person. So in his Pesach Inayim, he's also quote, he's, he's focusing on this verse. The pit is empty, no water. He says, this, it seems to say the language Ein Bo Ma'in, in order that we actually might read it as ayin bo. What is ayin bo? Or ayin bo, rather. Ayin bo means look within. So it's not ayin bo ma'im. Or rather, the absence commands us to inquire. So think, okay, so I want you to just, like, I'm not even sure we're going to look at the rest of the text, because that, like, little... Tweak there is amazing. So it's Ainbo to Ayainbo. Okay, very similar words. He's saying the language of Ainbo Mayim, it seems like it is extraneous, but it's not. Because if the pit is empty, your instinct needs to be to look. Now let's think back. Imagine a pit. Close your eyes and imagine a pit. Let's say the pit. The Torah Tamima says that the pit is 20 amos deep. Wait a second. 
what else is 20 amos deep? Or high? What else do we say is 20 cubits high? The Chanukiah, slash the Sukkah, slash the Eruv. And why can't those things be that tall? Because more than 20 cubits out, you can't what? See. Okay, so if the Torah Tamima is saying the pit is 20 amos deep, it means it is beyond our field of vision. So what do we need to do if we're not... Okay, so imagine you're, in a, you're, you're standing at the border of a pit. And instead of throwing your poor brother into it, instead what you're going to do is you're going to take a swan dive. What would you do? You'd shine lights into it, a light into it. You'd bring a flashlight. You would inquire. You would investigate. You would look. If something is empty, right, the absence of, the absence of evidence is not the evidence of absence, right? Something being not there or not visible does not mean it's not there. So it seems empty, but maybe it's empty because you can't see anything. Maybe it has tons of stuff in there. You just can't see it. So something being deep does not mean, right, the absence, the, evid the, the evidence of absence, looking into something and not being able to see into it, what we are required, what we are called upon to do is to peer, to look, to, to, uh, to, to, um, to bring our attention into the depths, into where it is not easily or obviously available. That's the power of the pit. So the chidah has totally turned this on its head. It's not empty. I mean, it's, oh, you think it's empty in a positive sense. No, it's empty in a negative sense, in the sense that it is too deep to see. So what you need to do in that case is to look into it. And why? His issue is that he wants to make sure that the brothers, you know, the point was that the brothers were throwing him into the pit not to kill him. So they needed to check the pit out to make sure it wouldn't murder him, right? That the pit wouldn't murder him. They wanted, you know, they wanted to do something else with him. They decided not to murder him. So they had to check the pit out to make sure it was okay. Um... And not just that, but remember, actually, you said, if the pit is empty, then how is there serpents and scorpions, Susie? In the nooks and the crannies. Right? So we say, ah, the pit is empty. So if you look into, like, a, a um, you know, hole, right? Like, oh, the hole is empty. But you're looking at the emptiness of the hole. What about what makes the hole the hole? The walls. Right? And in the walls, there are a bunch of little holes. Chorim Sudakim, right? Little nooks and crannies. And that's where things might be hidden, right? So there's two levels of hiddenness here. One is absence that's beyond your ability to see, which then requires you to bring your attention within, to bring your attention into that, to bring your sight and your vision to investigate, to be able to Bring yourself down into it. And the second thing is also what you often let evade your attention. The nooks and the crannies, the little cracks, the thing that you, the framing that you just kind of ignore, right? All of these, both of these things, the Pesach Hinaim says that it's, the pit is making, uh, makes you look. It makes you look. A fascinating, fascinating point, right? That he's saying that, this is, I mean, this is just about Joseph, right? But it's fat, it's really so interesting to me that the Torah Tamima here says the pit is more than, that is 20 almost deep, it's 20 cubits deep. Because, and he says this is exactly why these two texts are juxtaposed. About, the, about putting the Hanukkah light more than 20 uh, cubits up and about the pit being more than 20 cubits down. Because um, this is where your eyes are able to, uh, to function. Basically, this is where your sight is able to work. Um, so let's kind of bring this point back down to earth. Ha ha ha. Um, what we're left with here in looking at the choice the brothers made to throw Joseph into the pit is that Joseph, the uncoverer of the secrets, right, the miracle boy, is thrown into a space in which it is dark. It is concealed. And that's exactly where somebody who 
uncover secrets needs to be. Because to unconceal some, to uh, disclose something, it needs to be concealed. To reveal something, it needs to be hidden. So the pit is a is 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 a space of hiddenness, of concealment, both in terms of it being beyond your ability to see, right, twenty cubits down, and also full of these nooks and crannies, these holes that evade our attention. Now here comes the question of Hanukkah which is the, really, in a sense, the question of Joseph. How do we relate to the aspects of our lives that evade our attention, that resist our ability to see, that are higher or lower than what we can bring ourselves to bear? And the answer is, this is the power of the Hanukkah candle. This is the power of the Hanukkah lamp. To be able to bring a sense of illumination, not to banish the darkness, but in order to live in the darkness, to live in the pit, to survive the hole, to live through the winter. Hanukkah doesn't change the season into summer. Hanukkah takes the darkest, deepest nights of the year, when, when we're feeling the winter blues, and gives us a little bit more light, the light that we need. But and very importantly, not the light that we need to do more business. You're not allowed to count coins by the Hanukkah candles. You're not allowed to use them. You're only allowed to enjoy them. You're only allowed to let them let you see. You're only allowed to have them, and this is actually what we're going to talk about right now. How do we relate to this little sparks of light in the darkness? So it says, Ein bo mayim. This is the Reduk, or David, David Kimchi, another um, Rishon on the Torah. He says, there was no, ma there was no water. Right? This is actually actually what Susie said. If there was water in the pit, he would have drowned. And then he would have it would have been like they killed him. And the point was they weren't gonna kill him. And it says there was no water after it says that the pit is empty. Again, it seems extraneous. Maybe it was full of pit of pit a uh, pitch. It was full of um, basically goop. It was like a, it was full of goop, and maybe they would have like thrown him in a in a pit full of goop. And that would have been bad. Velo mespa and then he would have could have maybe died from that. Vadrash yadua, but the midrash in the Talmud, which we just saw, says shamar maim einbo aval nechashim akrabim yeshbo. It says there's no water, but there is serpents and scorpions. Fine, we've seen that a zillion times. Vim kainhu have kiilu here guhu. But if there were serpents and scorpions, then weren't they then throwing him to get killed by snakes? <laughs> right? Like, remember Indiana Jones, right? The scorpion is going to kill you. So isn't that also, I mean, the whole point of what Doc is saying is like, no water. Fine, good. So they're not going to drown him. But maybe there's a, maybe there's, maybe there's a goop in there. No, there's no goop. He's not going to drown in goop. Fine. But if there's serpents and scorpions, aren't those going to kill him? So it seems like this pit's going to kill him anyway. It says, Ki lo yadu shi asalo hakel neis velo yashkuhu. Because they didn't know that God was going to perform a miracle for Joseph. That the serpents and the scorpions weren't going to attack him. So, now let's, let's assume that they didn't know that there were serpents and scorpions there. Because remember, they're not able to see into the pit. So the serpents and scorpions are in the nooks and the crannies. They're hidden. Can't see them. And they didn't know. And here, and the, the point here is that the Redox says the pit is a site of a miracle. And the, the miracle happens when the hidden reveals itself. When these hidden darknesses, right, these hidden dangers, these scorpions and snakes, um, reveal themselves in a way that's potentially dangerous. And that's the, and that's the potential for miracle, right? Hanukkah is also a time for miracles. So another thing that brings Hanukkah and Joseph together is that Joseph, the miracle that Joseph uh, allowed Joseph to live has to do specifically with what it means to survive the pit, to live through the pit. Now this is kind of like a, a generic, a general point, but here's, here's the last thing I want to say on this, and this is fascinating. I think this is, um, this is a, a Musser writer, the Mesha Chochma, I think mayor of Dvinsk, a modern commentator. He says, The pit was empty, no water, fine. Wait, what? Aha. 
like who? If you see a place where a miracle happened for you, you say the blessing. Baruch asali neis b'makom azeh. Say the blessing. Bless are you, God, who made, who performed a miracle for me in this place. Okay, so the pit. What's the point of why is he why is he tagging this onto the pit? Because the pit is a site of a miracle. The miracle happens in a site of danger, in a site of darkness. Okay, so this is from within the perspective of Joseph, it seems. What's a miracle? Something that seems to transcend the, the rules of nature. Fine. And it's just like blessing on the Hanukkah lamp. Because there was a, there was a miracle done with the cruise of oil. We don't know that story. We don't have to focus on that right now. And here's the here's the hook, and this is what drives the whole thing home. I hope it does for you guys too. If we're, all we're doing is remarking on the miracle, then all you would need to fulfill that would be for you to glance at the Chanukiah at all. I remember I was like kind of jokingly saying before, oh, like this is the first like social media manager type thing, like a, it's a, making it go viral. Fine, but imagine, but let's actually use that as a real example. You're like scrolling through Instagram. Oh, double click heart, double click heart, double click heart. But it's just like, it's, it, it's just a stream of data, right? The point is to induce an addictive relationship between you and whatever's, you know, buffering, loading, whatever, the next thing in the, in the, in the feed. You're just glancing. But that's not enough, says the Mashach Chochma. Ach lehoros al neis pach shemen, tzarich davka shiyeh shalta be'ena, toch esrim ama. In order to truly promulgate, like to pronounce, to teach the miracle of the of the cruise of oil, your, your eye needs to be seized it needs to be arrested by the Chanukiah. And thus, it can't be taller than 20 amos up. Because if it were, all you could do, Jen, is just like squint your eyes and kind of see it. No, it needs to be something you don't just see, but that you experience. It needs to command your attention. <sighs> okay, so that, in a way, then, solves one side of the problem. The side of the problem it solves is why that the why is the Chanukiah, like the Sukkah and like the Eruv, only allowed to be within 20 Amos? Because it needs to not just be something you can glance at, but needs to be something you really notice, you really experience, that it commands and grabs and seizes and arrests you. That and I really want to encourage us for this when we light the Hanukkah lights starting this Sunday night, that you take your time to really look at them and to really think. But the problem is, though, is that it doesn't solve the Ravina side of the problem. It doesn't solve how can a Chanukiah then be below 10 Tfachim? How can it be below 10 hands breaths? Because then it would seem to actually go against what the Meshach says, because there not that also a space you can only glance? The answer is no. Why? Because unlike 20 amos away, 20 cubits up, like 30 feet, there you can only squint and look. But if it's low to the ground, you can still look deeply. And not just that, but the difference between that and, tw and 30 feet away is that 30 feet away, it doesn't change the darkness. 30 feet away, it's just a point of light, like a star in the sky. But below 10 tfachim, it is completely illuminating like a floodlight, the ground. It's changing the way you look. It's changing the way you walk. It's changing the way you, you, uh, you act, you, walk, you behave. It's arresting your attention. And not just, I think, not just is it grabbing your attention, but since it is lower than where you usually look, it makes you look at that differently. It makes you get lower. It makes you look. So 20, uh, you know, within 20 cubits, it's where you look anyway. But below 10 tfachim, it's what makes you look. It's what makes you pay attention. It's not aesthetic because it's low to the ground. It's, it's gross. It's dark. 
But Hanukkah is something more radical and more expansive than aesthetics. It's changing the way we relate to the darkness. That's the miracle of the Joseph story. That Joseph, the revealer of secrets, has to be deep, tucked deep within a pit, needs to be in the depths of the dark in order to be able to reveal the light. Not just reveal the light, but show how the light can, needs to exist within the dark. The miracle happens there, specifically in a place in which was empty, which was unable to be seen. That's where we bring our attention in Hanukkah, where we can't, where we haven't been able to look before. In the spaces we haven't seen, in the spaces that resist our attention, not resist, in the spaces that resist our attention, in the spaces that go beyond our attention. Hanukkah is about showing where God can be found, specifically where you wouldn't think otherwise. That's the radical power of Hanukkah, that it brings light where light would never go before. It brings holiness into the depths of the world, specifically where you think it wouldn't be. That's what we're going to keep on exploring Tuesday night as we look at the, uh, the, the unique quality of the Hanukkah candles being able to go that low. And I wish us all, as we look at the story of Joseph, as we see someone who has to, in a sense, go down very deep in order to be able to, uh, to climb out, to go down 20 cubits in order to get 10, 10 tefachim from the ground. May we all figure out a way to do that ourselves this coming Shabbos and this coming holiday. Shabbat Shalom. Thank you. Shabbat Shalom. And happy Thanksgiving. Yeah. A good gedenkstag to dear. <laughs>